up the romantics. Romantic art. And I'm going to show you a bunch of paintings. I like the paintings. A little bit about, you know, I'm sure there's a couple other things too if we can get to it. But the thing about this, this is not romantic love. I know that I, I know I've heard some of your feelings, but the whole thing about the romantics, you know, this is the idea of this very life idealized looking back at the way things should have been, could have been. And so kind of this looking back at it. But to idealize something and make it seem better, nicer, more appealing. So in special topics in American history, we're doing gangsters. And almost all the movies about gangsters kind of make it very romantic, appealing, when it's actually not at all. But here we get to the romantics. And here is an idealized version of the fall of Rome and the collapse. There was nothing at all like this, but a dramatic picture. A few other artists I'll show you, but let's get to a couple things about this. Is. And so the whole point is about this feeling that We've gone too far scientifically, far too much in the age of reason. We're trying to figure everything out too much, too empirical, too mathematical, and also too greedy. And so remember the Enlightenment, that 18th century. It's good. We can kind of control our violent impulses and work together, government together, that social contract, constitutions, equal rights. But that also directly leads to capitalism and the Industrial Revolution. And we can take natural laws and figure out society, remember Newton and John Locke. And then romanticism, this idea that civilization is corrupting us. So if you look at that painting, if you look at that painting here, and this is not, a, it's just, I was just romantic, first off, you always, dressed in the very, style, very wealthy style of that time, but he's in nature, he's in the country. He's away from the corrupting influence of society and learning for himself. So with that, what is romanticism? It is both liberal and conservative. There are liberal elements of that idea that we all have equal rights. There's, I, there's liberal romantics with this idea, we'll go back to this idealized time, those liberals who wanted Italian unification they look back to Rome and say, we can do that again. But a lot of it is conservative to go back to this different era. In fact, it's so weird to say this, but fascism and Nazi Germany were really romantic. I know that just sounds so weird to say, but it's a very romantic idea. We could go back to this time. And they didn't like modern life. And they hated the industrialization. The United States, some of you might have heard of Henry David Thoreau and the uh, Transcendentalists. They had the very same thing. We'll get away from the money rubbing of society. So there'll be a lot of artists. This is ancient Carthage. You're kind of going back, not to the way it was, but to the way we wish it was. We wish it was a certain way. And I can't emphasize that enough. They don't want to go back to the reality. They want to go back to their fake imitation made up reality. And you know we get people doing that all the time now. They kind of this route. I, if I could go back to medieval times and do this, or or go to war, that they ignore the reality of it. So these are the characteristics. Number one, lots of emotion and passion. Now sometimes it could be you know like romantic passion. A lot of the passion could be people you know, like fighting for something, and you know really showing their uh, true feelings and no longer reason. We will decide everything. We'll go through rational responses. They want irrationality. So emotional responses to things, which is actually kind of the way people are. And so this historical forces that made us, our knowledge could never possibly understand. They could never understand all the events that led up to what we are today. The point is, we can't come up with laws to govern nature. It's too strong. And so, um, the death of Beersheba, uh, biblical art, but showing the passion, the emotion behind it. Yeah. 
Was this also like going back to uh, Without a doubt, part of what happened with um, the reaction of religion to the Industrial Revolution would be to kind of go back, kind of very romantic view of religion. Say, let's go back to a uh, true religion. And they'll talk about that in the entire Industrial Revolution. In the 20th century, you might have heard the term fundamentalism. Yeah. That was very much a romantic effort in the teens of the 20th century. And once again, that was not to what the way religion was really practiced, but kind of our vision of it. They actually called it old timey religion. Here's Lady Macbeth, another one. We don't need to know the name of this painting, but I just like this one because it's from a Shakespeare, uh, a story about Shakespeare, good story. But the emotion, her face, you, know, you can see the despair in her face. That's very emotional, lots of passion in that. I don't know what this guy is doing, that he just looks creepy, okay. Number, number two, the individual. And there's a lot of the individual. And this idea of somebody who is like dreaming beyond this, this world of getting rich or buying scientific laws or whatever it might be, but dreaming of something different. And so every person is unique, especially the true dreamer. So implying that might be steps of who's better. And a lot of self-realization. We can find ourselves through art will do that, where we can find our own reality. I should add, this fits in the Industrial Revolution because by the 1840s you have photography. And so art is going to change. It's going to go from trying to represent reality to represent the artist's vision. And that would be romantic at first. And then it'll become probably my favorite type of art called impressionism. And so here, this showing of the a sea, the storm, a ship, a shipwreck, and the idea of these individuals see him trying to save and salvage himself of those who are just barely surviving as one solid, solitary ship. There's so many pictures of this. This might be one of the most famous, a German artist. And I've shown this before. I know you've probably seen it before. I mean, it's one of the most famous works of art, but it's the individual. And you'll notice something. They climbed up to a spot where they're overlooking the turbulence of civilization and they've rised above. I'm above the individual deciding for themselves. I like that. But also it's very, very, very kind of narcissistic. They're kind of in love with themselves. The rest of you are grubby and below me. It's no coincidence that a romantic thing to do, part of the romantic movement would be mountain climbing. I mean, why would you climb a mountain? Well, you can go up and then you come down again, big deal. Now, I'll do it. I will, I will climb above the rat race below. And remember that video we saw about medicine? They talked about how sport became popular and people started working out, that was romantic. As you can see from this close up, I still don't know how I do that. Here's another one. Uh, Friedrich was a lot of romantic art, the individual, back to nature. And it literally says the dreamer. What is he thinking about? We don't know. So we can put ourselves in that position. What would we be thinking? Here's another one, one tree. There's gonna be a lot of this pictures like this. You barely making it, but here's one tree, the individual themselves. Next, that gets right to this, nature. And this might be one of the biggest ones. Going back to nature, as society is turbulent, this new industrial revolution, this empirical, which is science and industrial, or just the money grubbing. We'll get away with it and go back to nature. Hiking became a big deal. We'll go on a walkabout and hike. And society is nature, but this idea that it could also be awe-inspired. How can we possibly control nature? Nature is powerful. Sure, it might be peaceful, 
We might think we can get mathematical rules, but it isn't different to you. We can all dream for spring, but nature has decided to snow for another three months. Winter will never end. When will winter end? When the next winter begins. I hope I'm joking. Okay, so moving on. But isn't this a beautiful scene where you see the power of the waterfall? I love the sun rising up. Where is that? Just purely made up in the artist's head. Made up. But going back to nature. So I look at all of you and I want to get away from you and pull back. It's very narcissistic, as you might want to get away with me from me. The whole point is it's our self individual and we can claim we're somehow a little bit better. There's a lot of um going to come known as social Darwinism. And so this is a famous one. I like this one. The Alps, a stylized avalanche. No, he didn't see an avalanche. He imagined it. And remember we did the Renaissance art? When Lutherberg did that, he set up the grid and did it all so it was proportional, but then made a dramatic avalanche. And you see it? This is what I like. Look how there's people. Look how small and insignificant they are. And they know it as a real and fear. And I like how they put them. If you look close, they're mostly naked, implying that in reality, humans have no defense. You're clothing them. That's what it's supposed to imply. As you can see from this mountain valley, too, it's nature. It's going. Give me a second. I did the two this. I'm not sure how I do it. I don't even know what I do. I it's slightly better this year, but so there's more. I like this one too. So uh, Ackerbach wrote that. He hadn't, been to, he hadn't even been to Sicily, but he wrote um, a storm off of Sicily. And do you see it? The mighty storm, there's nothing can stop the power of the storm. Can you see it? See the boat? At the mercy to nature. Oh, we might think we could conquer nature. It's also implied that that's a life raft. So what happened to their ship? Yeah, so what can we do? Here's another famous one. I really like this one. The shipwreck. See the body's knee. See the body. Storm. Hey, what's that? Angel flying, comforting the death, the dead, and nothing we could do against the power of nature. We can we can fool ourselves and think we can control nature with our science and our technology and our steam engine. We'll hear as a steam engine. By the way, next Monday, I will give you your project for the semester. And one of the things will be to make a working steam engine. I'll talk to you about how. That's one of the things. There'll be other things too. No, it's only steam engine. You can only make a steam engine or you go back to first grade. Another, I like this one. Yeah. Some crows, but this whole gnarled tree. So at a little bit of the individual, we see nature. We kind of underbrush below. I like that. Friedrich had a style. That's like the third one I showed to Friedrich. I like Friedrich. So I went to a museum and saw a bunch of Friedrich. So I was like Friedrich. Here's another one. Hey, guess who it is? But same deal. So here is two icebergs running together. Had he never seen that? No, he'd never seen that. He'd only heard about it and saw a drawing, and he came up with his imagination. But what does it look like? Hmm? A ship. Yeah, like a ship that's wrecked or, or some kind of construction that is being destroyed. But he's sure. Hmm? Oh, yeah. yeah. And you see the ship? This. But then, yeah, do you saw it? There's a ship. There is a ship. 
but he wants this to look like you have as a. Here's another shipwreck, the awesome power of nature. There's nothing we could do. That's a really famous one. He's a Turner, a British artist. A lot of good Turner cartoons. Did I say cartoons? Paintings. And look at the ship fall apart. And they're trying to save themselves, but they're at the mercy. You see the lock wrap that's the flaps. These are pretty cool. Now, let me be clear. If you go and see art, if you see this painting, they use oil colors when they oil paint. And when they paint, the paint has texture. And so the paint will give you kind of a 3D look as the texture. We don't see that in the flat picture like it. So I'm sorry, it's not as good. I know I should have got the art works of art here for you. And another one of the most famous ones, the Raft of Medusa. Medusa was a famous shipwreck. And the people on board the Medusa were shipwrecked for eight weeks without water. And a few survived. And so here it is showing their desperation. And what are they doing? They think they see another ship. So they're trying to sink and save the few that are dying. And, and I love the rough seas. What's Vesuvius? What is this place here? Do you remember? That's Pompeii. The city of Pompeii, south of Naples. So with that, now let's not be talking to one of your phone, Delaney. Four. Science. So science is this whole thing about dangerous science. That science has this undercurrent, that it's a beast, that it's uncontrollable, and you're toying with the very foundation of nature. So what you have to do is you have to list out a few of these and then explain a couple of these on your short ideas. That on one short ease. Everyone's gonna have to do that. I figure that's a good way to do this. Blake did a number of these things. And so that is new. And so it's showing Newton coming up with the mathematical formulas of the universe, but he is just a man with his tools, can't really do this. It was always this fear of nature. Blake was a, he also was an author. He's pretty wild. Yeah. I don't know if I showed you this one. I think I showed you something similar. Maybe I did show you this one for, for Newton. Yeah. Even though it's a little bit earlier, but yeah, it did. But it's more like, but it was also Protestant and every religion trying to adapt to the new changes of the Industrial Revolution. Because it's society completely changed. And so it would be a way of dealing with it. So good question. Here's another one, Blake. And here is God. And they show God is kind of the mathematician, but at the same time, the powers around them is beyond the compass. The compass was the mathematician's tool. So, next, not only is the science dangerous, it is dehumanizing. With this idea that machines are more powerful than people. And this had a real fear of capitalism, where machines dominated, science dominated, and who had the machines had the money. As they saw it, this made, this was the whole part about trying to get away to nature. And so here is a good of the capitalist. And look how they draw the capitalists. It's just kind of, see the faces? They're not quite human. They have turned into monsters who only want product. As see behind, it's hard to see. But these are all the workers separated from them, working in factories, horrible conditions. And here is one of my favorite works of art. So this is in the Tate Museum in, in London. It is awesome. Turner had this and is talking about the machine and what's that doing to society. Can you see it? You see the train? There's the train. But I'll show you a close-up. Oh, well, you notice the train comes through and look at the turbulence and the ruin that it creates. But look off to the side. It's racing past the old world. See the Roman arches with a bridge, the little boat? 
this is being brushed aside for the new machine, the new beast. It's called, yeah, rail, steam, and speed. And look at the face of the locomotive. Isn't that good? Is it, it's supposed to be like, face is the wrong word. It's supposed to get kind of like a face, see the mouth? You see it now? But it's not really a face. It's kind of human, but it's an inhuman beast that is now running over the old world. It's one of those, he painted a over it, so we got like two layers of oil paint. It looks like it's coming at you. And there's another Turner one, the slave ship. And the same deal where um, the old ways are being ravaged by the sea, um, the new, or the old capital, uh, the new capitalism is taking over because of the chains, bodies here, body. Yeah, that's a ship that's being ravaged by the high seas right here. You can really see the details. See a bird fly. See the chain. See it's a leg, a body snakes. Next. So they really romanticize this one. Constable, a British artist, might have been the most famous of this. He would draw these beautiful bucolic country scenes of this idealized country life of the yeoman or independent farmer. Now, let's be clear about it. Farming is very difficult, hard life, like any other life. You know, there's difficulties of it, but they made it all seem, as you are in the countryside and living this life, this is what you've abandoned. This fits in with what so many people are going to do. They're going to get their fortune, and what are they going to do? People still do it today. Well, now they really have to mostly spend a lot, but when they have extra, they buy land and try to act like a country gentleman. People come to Montana, what do they do? They try to act like a rancher, and they buy up land. And all of us know about them doing it. I mean, there's whatever about the sale of land, but yeah, people with a lot of money will do that. So this is not a thing just from the 19th century. This romanticized version of it. In fact, there's a whole television show that kind of talks about now that's pretty popular. I don't watch it or have never seen it, but I know what it is called Yellowstone. And it's kind of that romantic life. I know it's really popular. I will never watch it because that's Kevin Costner. And Kevin Costner is horrific. But, and if anybody likes Kevin Costner, there's something seriously wrong with you. Okay, I just have an irrational hatred of Kevin Costner. And yes, it's special time I'm showing a movie with Kevin Costner in it. I know, it's awful. Okay, who has seen Yellowstone? If you like it, that's fine. If you don't like it, that's fine. But that's really that romantic. It's very romantic. I know. I've I have good friends of mine who love it. They're like, you gotta watch it. Never. Huh? Yeah. But it also romanticizes the ranch life, doesn't it? And yeah. All right. So we can see see the uh, the plow horse, the nice country scene, the country manor. It's very nice, very beautiful. And with that, also there's a cornfield, same deal. And you notice the kids relaxing, getting a sip out of water right there, having the dog, little sheep dog, and there's a sheep. These bucolic, beautiful scenes, romanticizing, going back to that life. I like this one, little dog, I'm taking, I'm getting hay. There's the way, a wain is another word for a wagon, and comes fording this little stream. Was life like this? No, much more complex, but it made it seem nice to these uh, people living in the big city now. I don't know why I'm doing like this, but that means in the city. Or so, me. Gothic. This is romanticizing the Middle Age, and the term Gothic would be created for the Middle Ages and going back to this um, kind of idea of the Middle Ages. And so we start seeing Gothic architecture and Romanist architecture coming back. That's where we get Neo-Gothic. I'll show you some Neo-Gothic architecture in just a second. And there became an obsession with medieval ruins. So painting, this is Glastonbury. And the medieval uh, monastery there that had collapsed in the 17th century, and it left nothing but ruins. If you go there today, that's what it looks like today. They have a big music festival there, by the way, that gets thousands, like 
200,000 people come every year. Then they play right in these big ruins. But on the bits of these ruins. So you see all these paintings of it. And this is part of our vision to this day of medieval castles. They're all very stark and white and stone from the Romantic era because that's what was left. They don't have the bright colors and the tapestries that they actually were. The same reason why we look at Roman ruins and we see these stark uh, marble and granite statues or pillars, they painted them glorious colors, but those all passed, went away. Yeah. Would that also have been the same like the statues that you were? Exactly. They, especially the Roman statues, they were all painted. Right, garish colors and always repainted. But what do we see? The bare statues of. I think I mentioned this before. Whenever they had a Roman emperor, if those of you are first semester, do you remember the Roman emperor? There's always one Roman emperor doing this. Whose body was it? it was, yeah, it was always Augustus, and they cut the head off and put the new emperor on Augustus' head all over Rome. They just have a bunch of different. Of, of Augustus, who they made him about four inches taller. Yes, he wore a. Elevated shoes because he didn't like being so short. Of him going, and then new head. So here's another constable. Here is the huge cathedral. The towers um, over 100 feet high. Was 120 feet high of at Salisbury Cathedral. And if you're driving down the road today, you can see this tower coming for miles. And so he did a lot of these. But just imagine what a tower like that must have looked like in medieval Europe. It must have just been like awesome. Well, going back to this, and you notice it? Do you see it? Remember the going back to nature and that farm scene? See the cows on front. So he has that in there. I'll give me another one. He liked this cathedral with the rainbow over it. But do you see in front and then with medieval and back? So there's going to be a lot of those natural, natural scenes with medieval. Castle in Scotland, same deal. England is covered with these ruins of castles. But do you see it? Uh, shepherd, sheepdog. So put that all together. Here is one of Friedrich. And this Eldena, he took a ruin of another monastery, exaggerated the height, and then you notice the modern farm out there. Very much the Romantics out to us. German artists. British artists, German artists, the Romantics were the same. I like this one. Remember the individual? Nature, one tree. We can see the back. The idealized castle in the back. And you can see a lot of these. Yeah. You say it's like a English like Oh, sure. Yeah, there were a lot. And there were American ones too. It's called the Hudson River School. But uh, part of this, I'm doing ones I like. So you're going to have to like what I like. Got it? <laughs> but look at neo-Gothic architecture. Made in the 1840s. If see Parliament right along the Thames River, it's supposed to look like neo-Gothic Cathedrals back from 14 or 1300s. And the tower, what do you call the bell in this tower, by the way? That's Big Ben, yeah. And Parliament is massive. They only use a small, only a small part of it where they actually meet. If you go take a tour of Parliament, they'll take you through these rooms here. There's this big underground cavernous thing where they kept all the wagons of the House of Lords. When they used to have all their carriages, now it's just this big open cavern. It's really weird. And you walk through there. And right along the Thames, try to look like medieval. I didn't put this up there, but have you ever seen uh, Tower Bridge, the most famous bridge in London? That was a neo-Gothic. Everyone calls it London Bridge. It was Tower Bridge. And so they really looked into the supernatural, the exotic, uh, the talk of the occult. What's macabre mean? Chilling, terrifying. The hair of the back of your necks. So, you see a lot of ghosts. You're going to see fairies. You can see warlocks. You see the same thing with uh, this kind of romantic vision when it hit Ireland. You heard like leprechauns. That would all come about in this period. Demons, you name it. And a lot of 
like in your mind, like one of the shadows of your mind, like that dark spot, the demons, or those, um, or the path to madness. Have you ever heard of Edgar Allan Poe, the American romantic artist, and the Raven, those great stories about the macabre, I like Edgar. And so, materialism means stuff. You could have money, wealth, homes. It kind of rejects it, um, rejects it, say, no, we should look into the spiritual. What we can, what we don't know. What scares us. And so this would be the kind of thing where some of these romantic artists and authors are get around each, get around together and tell scary stories and, and freak each other out. Let's, yeah, let's tell scary, all these ghost stories. Out of this will come, and I didn't put this down, so put this down, science fiction. Science fiction would come out of this. And so instead of looking back, let's look forward. The first science fiction stories, Jewel Verne's and, and others, would be romantic. H.G. Wells at the end of the century. If anyone's ever read an H.G. Wells story, at least the first ones are really good. War of the Worlds, I highly recommend. It's romantic. So here, a little bit of the Erie Cemetery, and do you catch the Erie part? So it's a, it's like an old monastery or church, but all that's left is ruined. He made this up, but do you see what's scary? See the line of them coming in? Monks or somebody going into a building that appears to have, like it's just the facade. Like, What's going on here? Some ancient ritual in a ruin. Are they, what are they worshiping? And you guys missed out on the devil worshiping phrase of the late 70s, early 80s. But there was a whole thing hidden all across the, all across the world about fear of devil worshippers. So I can't help it. I see that because I grew up in it. Here's another one, the ruin. And do you see it? You see them? Going into a ruin? What ritual? Who are they trying to contact? That's actually, that's scary. And the best part is, can't you let your mind just go? That's the fun part. It doesn't tell you, it lets you think. And my guess is all of us could think of something very scary, at least scary to us. That's the most scary thing. It's not when they actually show you what's scary. They let you imagine what's scary. That's much more terrifying. Here's another one. The mania of envy. So it's just talking about envy, but look at that face. What does it look like to you? What do you think of when you see that woman look like that? What? what? Some cranky old lady. I see some lady some candy to try to get children to come. Have you heard of Han Hansel and Gretel? Or, yeah, think about that. Maybe a witch, Little Red Riding Hood. We have all those kinds of stories. That's what it's referring to. And here, another William Blake one. And I don't know what's going on, <laughs> but it's actually really scary. What Okay, so it's unclear. Is this, she's given her life for this baby? Is it Mary and Jesus and Christian? Is it the dying world and the world? And what's that? It kind of looks like an angel, but is it an angel? And you see the other thing. What's that? Huh? A fish. <laughs> I definitely look like that. And I like the great red dragon. What is she doing? This is that. See the dragon? See the creature? It's actually, if you saw the real, you know, I, I, I know it's a cop. You see the original? It's scary. Now, let me ask you something. What is she doing? These look like wings or from the motion of her arms, like going like this. Is she scared? 
or is she giving herself to the monster? That's how you. And then you can all read your own implications in it that we're not going to talk about in class. But so with that, there we go. Stonehenge, Cabra, that's a good one. And that's back when people be climbing all over Stonehenge. You know, now you can't get close to Stonehenge. Another one, the nightmare. You see her. Then see the monster. Now, here's the thing. Has she passed out in fear? Is she giving herself to the monster? And that is something they want you to ponder. That means has has it come under her evil swear? Sway. And notice the creepy horse in the back. <laughs> See, that's why we don't like the. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. What's up? <laughs> Here's a good one. The witch. What's that? Here and here. Right. Yeah, I know. It doesn't look like the ghost. We don't know. Is that another okay. image? Are they sorcering a path to someplace else? Do you notice the sky? And the, I also like this. See the face? Almost like a face there. The, don't these almost look like faces in agony? This is a good one. And then this is a famous one from Goya. Witches and their. And goats, as we all know, conjure up witches. Uh, we can go through a lot of these. The flagellants would beat themselves on some kind of religious ecstasy. But that seems more terrifying. Yeah. And one of the more famous ones, Saturn devours his son from Greek mythology. As Saturn. I thought it was. Roman, yeah. Roman, yeah. And, well, but devour and eat his son. And that's the whole idea about eating himself, eating what he's made up, and he would, um, but they show, I mean, the gruesomeness of this. And you can just work a lot about, like, nations destroying themselves. Okay, so Saturn eating them. I, I like these arts. Oh, and then lastly, nationalism. And nationalism, this idea of making your nation great. So that's Greek nationalism. She represents Greece. Do you remember that painting I showed you of Rome? Uh, I mean, about the... Um, Paris, 1830 revolution, yeah. very much like that. And nationalists would very much use female characteristics for this. I, yeah, I did put it up there. Very much that same idea. That's 1830. I showed you that before. I love the detail. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? The musket bearer right there. That painting is massive. It would cover double the size of this wall. Carthage, lots of Carthage. Here's victory after the great um, British victory at Trafalgar. And <laughs> the Imperial Horse Guard, this is French. Napoleon, lots of Napoleonic art like this. This is Spanish, and I showed you this before, Spanish Revolution. Um, let's jump right to here. And exotic and foreign lands. And this is where the first time you actually see them use the word sexy. When I mean sexy, don't think in terms of, uh, once again, romantic love. What I'm talking about here is something very exotic. It's exciting. It's different. You can go someplace else. Here's a picture, and here are tourists touring Rome. You can escape the reality. The first real tourism business would begin in the Romantic era. It's no coincidence that they discovered Pompeii in this era. And would also be an excuse for imperialism. Let's go capture these areas. And so here, the Venice Canal, the first tourist to go to Venice. I mean, the real, as a tourist location, as Venice was in a really rapid decline, would be these wealthy romantics from England. Here's the, the Master of Chios, but this is North Africa. Here, Tangiers in North Africa, the exotic markets. The salt in the Morocco, the exotic market, and you see with the walls, the ancient walls of Morocco. 
lots of um, ones of North Africa. Really big deal. Um, Turkish baths, and that would be of uh, this kind of exotic and decadent Ottoman Empire. Bullfighting had kind of died out, became very, very romanticized and exotic. We could, I got a lot of these. Even in Brighton, they made this tourist area called the Royal Pavilion as if you're going into North Africa because of this. I should have these are kind of gaudy tourist places now, but it was seen as this great romantic work. And we're going to skip this one. We're going to jump right to here. We're not running out of time. But add this last part. This is the first real novels are going to come about. The first real novels. And let me give you this gothic novels are going back. Jane Eyre, Wuthering Heights. I never read Jane Eyre. I read Wuthering Heights. And it was a slog for me, but also it was in college. And as you all know, because you, you're in school now, nothing is ever quite as good when you have to read it for a class. So it'd be one of those, you know, if I had to go back and read it, even you like the class or don't like the class, that's not the point. We all understand that, right? You know, it's just, that's the nature of the beast. But there's also some, like, I really like some, but I had to get over that. I have to do it. It's never quite as good. And then we get these historical ones. I don't know, it's pretty good. But this medieval story about medieval knights, it's kind of silly, but here's Les, Les Miserables. That's a good book. That's a really good book. And that's about the French Revolution. The Three Musketeers, this idealized version of that free. It's it's good. Les Miserables is really good. I like Ivanhoe. It's just hard to read. Many movies. <laughs> many, 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 many. And then the first science fiction. And Frankenstein, Mary Shelley would write that. And that, you know, what was Frankenstein's? Frankenstein was a doctor who toyed with science, the very fabric of life. Who's, has anyone had to read Frankenstein in class now? We got a couple. Which pen? Same here? Yeah. I think it's the best on the cliffhanger. Nope, you have no idea. Did you like it? Yeah, it, I had read it in class too, and I liked it, and then I went back and read it again, and I loved it. Because I was just reading on my own. I would highly recommend reading. That's one of those books, once you get into it, but it takes a while to get into it. It's a stop. But it's toying with, and Frankenstein's monster was toying with the very fabric of nature. And what happens? The monster turns against the scientists. Oh, and if you want to watch a really good movie, watch Frankenstein that has just a tiny little bit to do with the book, but it's great. Yeah. Okay, it's a little confusing. It gets confusing. Yeah. Uh, Dracula is another one of these romantic stories. The book, the story is actually OK, but it was tried to do this romantic story. But also it was a way to show um, to be a little bit risque, but do it in the form of a vampire kind of world. Yeah, it was meant to be very risque, but also romantic. It's OK. And so there is Frankenstein right there. And to make the black and white, in fact, in my special novice class, I always do science fiction 50s horror movies. It was black and white, but to make it look good in black and white, they had the color of the Frankenstein's monster to be green. And so that's why if you ever see like, later on when they start doing colorized version of it, they have the monster as green. In the book, no, it was human. It looked like a human. And if you want to watch a very funny movie, Young Frankenstein from 76. Which kind of mocks these souls. Has anyone seen that? Two of us have seen it. It's really good. All right, so that's the romantics. What I'm going to do is you must do a short idea. And you're going to have to do three characteristics. Sound good? One sentence explaining one of each characteristic. Sound good? Everyone got that? All right. I hope you, I hope you like the art. I'm fascinated by it. I just love their imagination. Even though there's a lot about the actual romantic ideals, I don't know. It doesn't mean I don't like the art. Where do you leave? High school? Okay. All right.
It's not evidence. They heal, but it's pretty nice. It's hard. It's just not going to get the right angle. Oh no, it's okay. Oh, she just rolls the back. Right on the mystery. Well, now it's we are just at the long camera trim. Oh, I should be somewhere. It's like, okay, so we'll just watch this again. Even for all the rather than actually, yeah, it gives you a little bit of 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 Long haul. Where you go, man? Brent Paul's in this town. Where else are you? Yeah, I see. Yeah. It's somewhat of a classic thing. Not too rough. Stay away. Goodbye, everybody. Have a good weekend. Enjoy the snow. Then walk by. Oh, no, you look yours over. I'm going to smell with you. But then in the winter ends and now we have to smell. Bad vibes. What's that? I say bad vibes. Find it. Probably something. Bad vibes and music. Do you like being a Dutchman? Yes. That's a good show. Good shoe. Good shoe. Frankenstein. I am the first time.